everyone. Hello. Thank you all so much for coming out and spending your evening with us. My name is Amali and I'm the events director here at Books Are Magic. So we are so excited to have Julia Lee and Hua Xu with us tonight to celebrate the launch of Julia's newest book, Biting the Hand. But before we get into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. First off, mask wearing is optional, but encouraged at tonight's event. If you'd like an extra mask, we have plenty of extras up at the front register where you checked in. We'll be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of tonight's discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Julia will be signing and personalizing books at the alcove next to where you checked in. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we would love to encourage you to buy a copy of Biting the Hand online using the link in the live stream description. All right, let's get into this. Biting the Hand, hailed by Jamaica Kincaid as vivid, powerful, and empathetic, is a searing confrontation of frequently overlooked parts of the Asian American experience here in the States, and an incredible story of Julia's own journey forging her identity as a Korean, a Korean American woman. Julia Lee is the author of Our Gang, A Racial History of the Little Rascals, and The American Slave Narrative and the Victorian Novel. She's an associate professor of English at Loyola Marymount University, where she teaches African American and Caribbean li literature. She lives with her family in Los Angeles. And as I mentioned earlier, Hua Xu joins Julia in conversation tonight. Hua is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of Stay True, a memoir. All right, that's all from me. Without any further delay, please join me in giving Julia and Hua a very warm welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> so I guess I will start with a short uh, excerpt from an early part of my book. This is from chapter three. Um, so Biting the Hand is a memoir, and it's about, you know, sort of figuring out how to navigate the black-white binary in this country from the perspective of somebody who doesn't fit um, into those two categories. So talking about my um, upbringing, um, and my young adulthood, childhood, young adulthood, as a Korean American girl, daughter of immigrants who grew up in Los Angeles. Um, so this comes from the third chapter and talks about an incident that occurred when I was about 10 years old. Um, I was going to a Catholic school in West Los Angeles that was predominantly white. Um, and one of my friends at the school, um, had a job opportunity for me through her mother. And so it, it reveals a little bit about the racial experience of how I figured out, okay, where do I fit in? My first school, at, my first friend at my elementary school was an Irish Italian girl named Erin who was born prematurely and had a large scar on her arm, the result of an IV mishap when she was an infant. Erin lived with her mother near the school in a duplex that smelled of cigarette smoke and had large signed posters of mash hanging on the wall. Erin's mother had been a script supervisor on the series, which ended its run in 1983, and she was on unemployment while trying to get staffed on a new show. I'd never seen MASH before, but vaguely knew it was about the Korean War. My parents, who had actually lived through the war, had never seen an episode either. Erin's mother eventually landed a new job on a sitcom called Designing Women, another show that I did not watch. I was now 10 years old and my favorite sitcom was Punky Brewster. I watched the show every week with my dad and my sister, wrapped as Punky dealt with the aftermath of the Challenger disaster or learned the dangers of hiding in abandoned refrigerators. Although my family lived in Los Angeles, Aaron's mom was the only person we knew who was in, quote, the industry. 
When she asked if my sister and I wanted to audition for a part in Designing Women, I was thrilled. I thought I was going to be the next Soleil Moon Fry. My mother, on the other hand, was dubious. She already thought TV was a bad influence, rotting my brain when I could be practicing the piano or doing my homework. She also believed actors were one step removed from prostitutes, parading themselves in front of strangers for money and attention. Erin's mom was persistent, though, telling her that the casting director was having trouble finding enough Asian child actors to audition for the role. She assured my mother that it would be a wholesome experience. I'd never acted before, not even in a school play. In the car on the way to Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, my sister and I rehearsed the audition script. The part was for a Vietnamese boat child named Lee Sing, whom ex-beauty queen Suzanne Sugarbaker, Delta Burke, agrees to foster for a few weeks. I didn't know any Vietnamese, and I wondered if I was supposed to have an accent. I couldn't even imitate a Korean accent. I talked like a valley girl. The scene took place in Suzanne's, quote, powder room, where Lee Sing played with the fancy bath products and bantered with Suzanne. What's a powder room, I asked my mom from the back seat. I have no idea, she snapped. She was in a bad mood. Burbank was on the opposite end of the freeway, uh, opposite end of the city, across four major freeways at the height of afternoon rush hour. An hour later, we pulled into the studio lot and the guard in the kiosk dress, directed us to a bungalow. As we waited to be seen by the casting director, I saw another Asian girl in a party dress and frilly socks, holding a headshot in her hands. She looked like a pro, skipping into the casting room when called. Her mother eyed us while we waited. My sister and I did not have headshots. We'd come straight from school and were still wearing our plaid jumpers. My mother had on her pioneer chicken uniform of brown pants, beige shirt, and SAS shoes. I kept my eyes down, trying to memorize the script, feeling increasingly nervous. A short time later, the girl bounced out, looking pleased and telling her mother she thought it went well. It's now my turn. I was ushered into a small office where a white woman and white man greeted me, then seated themselves on director chairs. They asked for my headshot and I told them I didn't have one. No problem, they said. The woman explained that it was a big role with lots of screen time. In the episode, Lee Sing and Suzanne would become fast friends and Lee Sing would even get to wear Suzanne's pageant tiara and dress like her in big hair and makeup and a 1980s power suit. Uh-huh, I said. I'd seen a picture of Delta Burke and thought she looked like a member of White Snake. The woman began running through the lines with me, playing Suzanne's sugar baker to my Lee Sing. It was over in a minute. For days afterward, I pestered my mother. Did I get it? Did I get it? Eventually, Aaron's mother broke the news, saying my sister and I didn't, quote, look Vietnamese enough, and that the casting director had decided to go with a professional actor. I was crestfallen, so much for child stardom. But mixed in with my disappointment was a dawning awareness that my race itself required a kind of performance. I knew Lee Sing was supposed to be a ham, like any other child actor in a sitcom. But I also understood I was supposed to perform a stereotypical Asian-ness, which meant speaking in broken English, marveling at American novelties like Bubble Bath and Southern Bells, and becoming Suzanne's doll and plaything. Lee Sing wasn't even a Vietnamese name. She might as well have been called Oriental Girl Number One. I wish I could say I felt degraded by this realization or angry at the white screenwriter for writing such a caricatured role. But I was mostly annoyed at the other Asian girl I'd seen at the audition, the one in the frou-frou dress. I was certain that she had landed the role and that she'd been able to give them the performance they wanted. She was my competition for white attention and approval, and she had one out. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. Um, this is your first book event, correct? It is. Yeah. Oh my gosh, my first reading. <laughs> yeah. Thank that you, everybody. Your, for hey, that was your first reading? I mean, I'm a teacher. I read a lot, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Um, so we'll talk for a little bit, and then at a certain point, we'll open it up to Q&A. But um, thanks so much for having me do this. It's funny because we've known each other for quite a long time. I've never heard that story before. Um, and I'm wondering... 
you know, throughout the, the memoir, there are all of these moments that are probably processed differently as a child. Like, I think it's so natural what you describe in that scene where you project your um, grievance toward this rival girl, right? I guess at what point did that story kind of become really meaningful to you as this, uh, I, I, like not an origin story, but just as something that kind of had a broader resonance for who you were? Um, I think, you know, the sense of rivalry of seeing yourself competing with other people of your racial or your identity group and feeling like you have to fight with them for the spoils um, is something that I've been thinking about a lot. And, you know, I can see the way that it ends up becoming distorted in lots of other ways, too. I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine who's Korean American. She's about five or six years younger than me. And it's interesting because within that five or six years, you know, she actually, you know, actively pursued a career in acting and modeling. And she told me that at that point, you could tell that the, the, the things that changed, shifted, and now people wanted to have a more diverse and multicultural cast of characters. And so when she would go to auditions and she saw that she was the only Asian person there, she knew she had a better shot of getting the job because she knew she filled that quota. But again, if there had been another Asian girl there, she would have known that she was fighting with that same Asian girl for that one Asian spot. And I just thought, God, that's so messed up and so twisted. And it's something that so many of us who come from minoritized identities completely get, even if we've never talked about it. And it creates such tension within people who should be our allies, right? These are people who are in the same situation as us. And instead, we end up thinking of them as our rivals. And then, you know, we fight them or we see them as the enemy rather than as the friend. So, you know, you, you refer in that passage to uh, Pioneer Chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, your mom wasn't particularly interested in pushing you towards this dream of becoming uh, of, of representation and, and being on the silver screen. <laughs> <laughs> for, those of, for those of the people here who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, like, can you tell us a bit about kind of where you grew up, what your horizons were like back then, sort of what success looked like within your family? Um, I think that, and I still feel this way, I think that for my parents, they wanted me to have, my parents were Korean immigrants, they owned a liquor store in Inglewood, which is a predominantly black and brown neighborhood in Los Angeles. Um, they owned that for a short period of time, and then they purchased a Pioneer Chicken, which is fried chicken fast food restaurant, which was subsequently, I mean, it went bankrupt, and then it was purchased by Popeyes. So you guys probably already know, all know about Popeyes, which is a lot cooler now than Pioneer was in the 90s, um, 80s and 90s. But um, so for my parents, you know, they definitely did not want me to take over the business and, you know, be running a fast food restaurant. And so they busted their asses so that I and my sister could have professional jobs where we wouldn't have to, you know, get our hands dirty, quote unquote, and we could have a steady paycheck and not feel constantly vulnerable to, you know, the economy and whether people were buying enough fried chicken or whether there was enough corporate advertising so that people came in and all of these sorts of things. Um, and I still feel that way today. I mean, I'm a professor, I'm a college professor like you are, and I still feel a lot of gratitude sadly because I'm like well actually this might be changing but honestly for a long time I was like oh this job is great because I get a steady paycheck and I don't have to worry about being shot at work which sadly is changing now <laughs> but honestly when I first got into teaching I was like you know my parents worried every day that they would go to work and they might be shot to death and at least I don't have to worry about somebody trying to steal money from the register and losing my life um but as you all know, nobody is safe from that now, so. <laughs> so, you know, when you, were, when you were a child growing up, obviously, I mean, we now sort of, I think it, it applies to a lot of people where you understand your parents' struggles very much in retrospect, like it becomes this narrative that you can, uh, you know, assimilate into who you are, but also just recite. But, uh, like, when you were a kid, what did you think about all this? Like, because uh, it sounded to, as though there was some sense of, you know, envy for other forms of childhood or other forms of, of uh, other models of parenting uh, at the schools you went to. Yeah. I mean, it would have been nice to get some affirmation at home. Like, that would have been nice, you know? <laughs> it would have been nice to not have to go to the store every weekend. You know, other people would 
like I remember just wanting to go to birthday parties and not being able to go because my parents had to work and there was nobody to bring me to the birthday parties. And so, you know, I'm sure those of you who are restaurant kids, you just live at the restaurant. That's where you do your homework. That's where you take naps. That's where you hang out on the weekends. Um, so for me, school was really a space where I could actually socialize and hang out. And I did envy, you know, those friends of mine who didn't have those responsibilities or those obligations um, and who could just yeah, in some ways, be innocent, you know, just be kids. Um, yeah, you know, I tell a story in my book about my friend Sharon. Sorry, that's her real name in the book. <laughs> her name is Eileen. Just kidding. <laughs> Eileen, I mean, she's cool with, I mean, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> she would be cool with it, I promise. What's, hey, what's her last name? <laughs> <laughs> and what's her social security number? <laughs> Okay, so Eileen in the book, so I talk a lot about her. She's my closest friend in, in high school. And, you know, she had this um, incident where, you know, she was, you know, a speech and debate nerd and she went to this tournament and she had a great time. It was out of town. It was the first time leaving Los Angeles. And she came back from this um, trip and couldn't wait to tell her parents about it. And then her mother picked her up and she started, you know, just bubbling over with all of this excitement. And her mother says, stop we're going to the hospital because your father was shot in a robbery this weekend. And her, her parents owned a liquor store, Korean American immigrants. And Sharon just started, oh God, Eileen just started crying because she was wanting to like tell her mother about this awesome trip and share with it. And, you know, and, and there was a moment where she just felt such guilt because here were her parents risking their lives so that she could have this nice education and this nice trip. And yet she couldn't even really enjoy it because meanwhile they had almost, her father had almost gotten killed. So I think that tension was always, always there. You couldn't fully enjoy it because you knew how much your parents were sacrificing to allow you those gifts. What was their vision of, uh, of success? Like what did they want for you at that in this period of time? I think they wanted a steady paycheck they wanted physical safety. If I could have health insurance, that would be amazing. Yeah, that's huge. The health insurance, health insurance is, like is huge. I mean, I... Cornerstone of Asian American parenting. Oh, my God. And, like, I talk a lot about health insurance in my book, I realize. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it was like, when you're not insured, it is always... You're always thinking, how am I going to pay for, you know, my root canal? How am I going to pay if I get shot at work? You know, how am I going to... I don't know, like... It's something that, you know, is one of the reasons why I believe in universal health care, because I know that the decisions I made in terms of career were very much based on whether or not I would have coverage. And I guess I'm astonished when I meet people who are like, but what do you mean you took that job even though you didn't want to do it? And I'm like, dude, it came with health insurance. What are you talking about? Um, so, yeah. So I think that's a huge, huge part of it, too. You know, so throughout the book, there are these themes of like, anger, grief, um, rage, shame. I'm wondering like, you know, cause when we're, ch when we're kids, we are sort of processing everything. And I'll say like kids up until maybe like your twenties, you're just sort of processing things in the moment. Like where did you, at what point did you get the language to think about like, oh, what I've been feeling all of this time is rage or what I've been feeling all of this time is shame. Does that make sense? The language, I think, happened much, much later. I mean, in the moment, I think that you just feel those emotions. You don't have a way of translating them or articulating them. You just feel terrible. And, you know, I think about how anger is so primal and shame is so primal. And I think all of us, right? That I think it's one of the preliminary emotions that you feel. It's like, what is it, the lizard brain or something before, <laughs> right? Before executive functioning comes in and all of that stuff. So I just think it's super primal. And so, you know, I think it really took until, I mean, I'm like 46 now, and I really think it took me up until this age to finally come up with ways of explaining what I was feeling without trying to, you know, punch somebody in the face or, you know, I don't know, hurt myself. Like all of those um, ways in which you try to cope with feelings of rage and feelings of shame. Well, how did, like, how did that come about then? 
I mean, I think it's age. I think it's also a lot of therapy. I believe so wholeheartedly in therapy. I also believe in phar psychopharmaceuticals. So I think that, you know, be finding a good antidepressant. I, I'm serious, right? Um, I also think just, yeah, getting older. I think having children. Because I think some of these things that I didn't want to deal with, I could kind of repress. And then when you have kids and you see your kids replicating the exact same coping mechanisms and grappling with shame and anger. And that's the moment where you're thinking, oh dude, like I have to, I have to confront this. I have to deal with this because it's being passed on to the next generation and I cannot watch that happen. What role did, you know, writing this book have uh, or play in sort of like processing some of this or sort of being able to um, kind of understand your own story as like these interlinked episodes? So I, I teach black and Asian American literature and um, we talk a lot about, you know, how does one process trauma? How does one process terrible things that happen in one's life? And one of the things that I've determined or that my students have helped me determine is that it really is through the act of storytelling through writing, through connecting to sharing one's stories with others, that you figure out a way of moving beyond the trauma. There's um, one of my favorite authors is Toni Morrison, and Toni Morrison talks a lot about this, about how storytelling, telling stories, revisiting memories, horrible traumatic memories from the past, historical trauma, um, that many people just want to repress it and forget about it because it's so painful that you are trying to do that in order to survive. And anybody who has dealt with PTSD, the aftermath of some horrific experience, understands that sometimes you have to black out, you have to forget it in order to move on. But that that's just a Band-Aid because it's still there and it's still waiting to come out at any moment, which is why you have to revisit it and you have to process it and you have to talk about it which is simultaneously an act of re-traumatization. It's so painful. And yet you have to re-traumatize yourself in order to get to the other side to heal it. And I have to say, like even, you know, tell, talking to somebody about how I had to, I had to narrate the, or had to, I was invited to <laughs> narrate the audiobook, and I was shocked at how I was reading sections and I still like sobbed in sections. And I thought I had processed it. I'd written it. It was public or not published, but almost in published. And, um, just retelling the story made me feel like the wounds had reopened and I had to take time and like sob in another room before I could continue narrating. Um, but I think each time I tell the story or each time somebody reads the story and can understand it, um, that is one step closer to that sense of healing. Did writing about it, I mean, because it, it, it sounds like a very painful process to write this book, right? Did, did it, I don't know, like provide any sense of contentment or a vision of what it would be like to move on to it? Did it feel like you were putting it on the page and then uh, sort of cultivating a different relationship with these feelings? Or is it just re-traumatizing <laughs> to have this conversation I was say, right now? I mean, I think that... Um... I mean, I joke about how I wrote most of this on the couch during COVID and, you know, I honestly, it was, I mean, I mean, that was basically survival time anyway. Um, but, you know, something is, is I, I, like, I literally went to the cat cafe here, like two doors down just before this reading earlier today, because sometimes it is just like, I have like five animals, no, how many animals do I have? Five animals, two, two dogs and three cats. And literally, like, I feel like that's what helped me get through the writing of it because then your cats don't care your dogs don't care and so they just hang out and you're like okay I'm running through this terrible section and you know in, in parts of the memoir I also talk about little like my son who was definitely not it was this is not an age appropriate book for him but he was like eight or nine and he was reading over my shoulder and read some section about spiders and then was like hey mom you know your facts are incorrect because I'm reading Charlotte's Web right now and <laughs> And those are the moments, and I actually integrated them because it was really, it was good in some ways to be like, okay, I'm in this like not great space, but then here's somebody interjecting with my life now. And, you know, there is a lot of trauma in, in the book, but I also think that doesn't define me or anybody who survives. 
these things that there's a lot of like life and joy and um you know my life is really good now and so I wanted to emphasize that and not just dwell in like victimhood or victimry well the title can you talk a bit about sort of how that comes about because I feel like that is sort of your mentor giving you um you know a sense of kind of how to turn turn all these negative feelings into something else um, so the title of the book comes from something that my mentor, Jamaica Kincaid, told me, um, you know, probably 20 years ago. Um, I was a graduate student at Harvard, and I was in the English department, which, as Hua can attest to, is not a great, not a, not a super warm and fuzzy environment. Um, but in any case, I... <laughs> I no, I, I agree. I, I, was, I wasn't in it, but uh, facts, major facts. Facts, but... anyway. <laughs> And so, you know, I ended up um, getting a job as a grader with Jamaica Kincaid, who was actually in the African American Studies Department, which was adjacent just across the hall. Um, and, you know, early on when I was working with her, you know, she would sometimes say these things like, you know, Julia, you really, you have to learn to bite the hand that feeds you. Otherwise, you know, how can you figure out who you really are? And I remember she said this to me and I was like, I don't even understand what that means, but okay, you know? And, and then I would, I think she said it in some graduation speech to, some students at a small liberal arts college, you know, I think you can find it. Like, so it, this is something that she often tells students and young people. And it really took me a long time for it to finally sink in because she's not, she's definitely, she's not, you know, being like, as an adult, this is what you should, she's not like that at all. So, you know, it, it was only much later that I was like, oh, you know, in some ways what she's telling me is this really important piece of advice is that you can't, just stay grateful and obedient and submissive your whole life, you have to at some point, especially if you see injustice, even if it's from a figure of authority that you had respected or that had done something supportive of you, that when you see injustice, you have to bite back. You have to bite the hand that feeds you. Otherwise, you're gonna remain in a space of perpetual subordination. Um, and really when writing the book, I mean, honestly, it was through writing the book that I kept going back to that image and kept going back to that phrase. And the title of the book came later. I mean, I had written the whole thing and still didn't have a title. What and, were the alternate titles? Just like, uh, I just always love hearing these. these I mean, I, I originally I wanted to call the book We Too, because those are the, fi the final line of my book was We Too Are America. Mm -hmm. And, um, but... And I understand this, you know, people would read it and think, oh, it's a Me Too novel or it's, you know, it's it might be deceptive or confusing. And so I, you know, we were trying to brainstorm other titles and so many of the titles just felt like they were a little bit too ambiguous or a little too, I don't know, I really wanted, I really wanted a, a title that captured the anger I feel. <laughs> I didn't want a wishy-washy title. Um, you know, like... A, great memoir um, and also a memoir a lot about pain and mother-daughter relationships is Crying in H Mart. Mm -hmm. And I very much did not want to highlight the crying. There's so much crying in my book, right? But don't, <laughs> it's not a sad book. That's the thing. I did not want that to be highlighted. I wanted it to be more a sense of like defiance and anger and also, you know, triumph in some ways yeah. that I'm not gonna be told to like sit down and be quiet. No, it's a perfect title because it captures that aggression. It's also kind of, <laughs> yeah. it's also kind of funny, and I think that's an, another aspect of the book that um, those of you who haven't read it, it's just like that I'm funny, scene, right? Yeah, no, like that I'm scene funny. was like heartbreaking, but also kind of hilarious. Like the uh, when you went to the uh, designing women thing, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, like Jamaica Kincaid gives you this advice. Now you are entrusted with the young minds, right? I'm wondering if writing this book and sort of processing your experiences, how has that come out in your teaching and your mentorship, if it does? Or, or how is teaching sort of giving you a different perspective, kind of being exposed to people who are going through things that you recognize as having gone through yourself? I'm so much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> I joke in the book, like when I first started teaching, I was 22 years old and, you know, I looked like I was 15 and, um, you know, I really, it was hard for me to feel like I was being taken seriously. And a lot of my students didn't take me seriously because I look their age. And so, you know, the joke, I mean, they, they secretly called me General Lee 
because I was so strict and I like, y you know, I just, I wouldn't let them take advantage of me. I was really, really, I never cracked a smile. Like, what was that joke about if you're a teacher, don't crack a smile until Christmas. That was like, I never smiled. And, um, I know, which is hilarious now because all I do is laugh in my classrooms now. And I think partly that's just getting older and, you know, yeah, not feeling like, I mean, the students are like my children's age now, so it's not the same, but, um, but I did considerably loosen up. And I think that a real shift in my teaching happened when I shifted teaching environments. I had always taught at places like Harvard at, you know, elite private high schools at in predominantly white environments where I did feel like the only way to be seen of as an authority was to approximate whiteness as much as you could, whiteness and maleness. And when I started teaching at UNLV, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, I suddenly was in a classroom that was about 60 to 70% students of color and ranged in age from 18 to, you know, 55. And they were a totally different student population. And I suddenly realized, what am I doing? I am comporting myself according to these codes of behavior that don't work here. And also, I am not white and I'm not a man. Why am I trying to act like a white man? And these students were, you know, like me, like a lot of them were immigrants or the children of immigrants. A lot of them were poor or working class. A lot of them had elderly parents. A lot of them were working three jobs and trying to go to school. And I just thought, you know, being a hard ass about things like, you know, your essay was three minutes late or, you know, you missed three classes instead of two this semester. I mean, who cares, right? No, but there are people who I worked with who really cared. And I was, and so that really changed. And then the other thing, because I loved my students there, but I also love my students at Loyola Marymount, and one of my former students is here in the front row, <laughs> Carrie. Um, and one of the things I also love about my students is that they teach me so much stuff that I think you really have to have a sense of, like, openness, because you don't know anything. You think you do, and, you know, whatever, but you don't. Um, you know, one of the things I laugh about, because Carrie was my last class before COVID completely shut down campus. So I actually never even saw her graduate. We just left, and this is my first time seeing her since 2020. Yep. Wow. Anyway, but, but, but Carrie cracked a joke in class about a, a Lizzo line about, I'm 100% that bitch. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, oh, Dr. Lee, it's a Lizzo song. You wouldn't understand. And... Three years later, I've, I've been to a Lizzo concert. I now teach Lizzo in one of my classes, and I totally credit Carrie for that. Uh, we're going to open up the Q&A uh, audience in a moment, but, you know, when you first asked me to do this, you said we could just talk about grad school the whole time. But um, I thought that that would be unwise, because the only people who care about grad school are grad students. But do people ask you whether... I, I am curious, like, it seemed like a very traumatizing experience. I mean, it, it was. It wasn't traumatizing for you? <laughs> yeah, but I was in a different, pro I was in a much more laid back program okay, than you yeah. were. Um, so, but I'm, I'm wondering like when students ask you whether they should go, what you say, like whether they should pursue a PhD. I mean, you have, you know, you do teach now and you sort of draw on presumably things that you did in grad school. I guess, like, how you look back on that experience. Um, I usually say, do not go. That is generally my advice, because I would never want anybody to go through what I went through. Um, you know, occasionally I will have a student who still wants to go to graduate school, and I'm totally supportive, because God knows the profession needs to be diversified, and, you know, we, know, we need those people there. But I also love my students, and I don't want them to suffer in the way that I suffered. So it's hard. Um, I don't know. I told you not to go to grad school, right, Carrie? Yeah. Yeah, I told Carrie not Carrie, to do you go to grad school? No. Okay. <laughs> you, seem like, to you seem like... I know, look how happy person. she is and how yeah. well-adjusted, you know? Because <laughs> I love you, Carrie. <laughs> um, cool. So, do folks have questions? I'm sure someone has a question. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your process on, like, what it was like to write a memoir. Like so many components from childhood, I feel like I personally have repressed and also do not remember. <laughs> um, so like, what was that? And, and you mentioned that you had written it while like in the middle of COVID. And so it, I'm sure you had like a lot of time, but like, 
do you have to take breaks? Like, do you have to like talk to a bunch of people to kind of like get the details back together? Um, yeah, we'd just love to hear about that process. I'm gonna repeat the question first okay. uh, for our audience on C-SPAN and on YouTube. <laughs> um, the question was to talk about the process of writing, um, kind of unearthing old trauma, but also just the process of recollection because there's so many kind of details that probably you'd forgotten about, sort of how you recover that pro writing process, things like that. Yeah, so um, I have a really bad memory, I have to say, in some ways, like I feel like I'm going senile, but, but I hold grudges like you would not believe. <laughs> So I, it was not hard for me to remember a lot of these things. They are burned in my memory. And I still, I mean, I mean, I, I use this term in my book, Han, which is this term to describe is a particularly Korean sense of vengeance, injustice, rage, hatred, and like, mes like misery. And anyway, I, I totally have that. And so all of these things that I... I mean, I almost was like, oh my God, this is my burn book. Like, I'm just going from one person that annoyed me to the next, to the next. And people are like, how do you even remember these things? And I'm like, oh, I remember. And so, but, so yeah, so that, so, so with the counter to that is that, and I say this thing in my acknowledgements, is that I always remember when people hurt me, but I also always remember when people do something kind to me. And so part of it is, you know, I think it is, it's like that lizard brain, right? Those are the, the moments where your rage and your shame are activated. Those are the ones that you remember. You don't remember the other stuff. Like, I don't remember, you know, what I ate for breakfast this morning, but you know, if you wronged me, just watch out. I do not, I do not forget or forget. <laughs> What's the oldest grudge you hold on to? Oh man. What is the oldest? Oh, so when I was four years old, I'm telling you, I went to this Easter egg hunt at my local public park and I swear to God, and my dad was just like, my sister was a year and a half younger than me. He's like, just join the three and under Easter egg hunt. Who cares? Whatever. And I found the golden Easter egg. And so I was supposed to get this big Easter basket and the lady asked me, so how old are you, little girl? And I could not tell a lie. And I told her I was four. And she took the Easter basket away from me. Like, I spent all of Easter crying because I had thought I had... I still hate that lady. That is so cruel. Why would you do that to a kid? No, this is... Uh, I, I agree. This is, this is an urge grudge. This is good. It's okay to hold on to this one. Yeah. Um... You don't know her name, right? You haven't I do not, this person but I or anything? hate, I okay. hate her. Okay. We all do. We all do, <laughs> right? That's yeah. inexcusable, yeah, unforgivable. Great. I agree. Uh, other questions? You over here? Yeah, can you describe what it was like moving from the English department to the African history um, department? What did you, what did it feel like? What were you reading? Why was it so different? Great question. So uh, what was it like to make that transition from the English department to uh, was it Africana studies at the time? Or? I think it's still called Af the Department of African and African American okay. Studies, maybe. Um, yeah, but what that, because it's a pretty pivotal moment in the book, yeah. is sort of your discovery that there are other floors of the Barker Center yes. to hang out on. And much cooler people on the second floor. Yeah, no, for sure. And Paul was one of them. Um, so I, so I never officially changed my departmental affiliation. I was all I graduated with a degree from the English department, but I definitely, at a certain point in my graduate education, stopped hanging out in the English department and was always just over in the African American Studies department because they had a really nice study room. So did Am Siv. Am Siv had a nice little, not as nice, not the same, not as nice, but. But um, AFAM Studies, it was just like a warmer, more comfortable um, place. And I also befriended a bunch of people who were in that program. And so we just hung out, um, you know, when they would have events, um, you know, one of the things about grad students is that you're always broke and starving. And so they had great food. They had great yeah. food. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, the English department was always like lousy food. And, Cheese cubes. Yes. Yeah. And then AFAM would have like soul food yeah, and Cuban yes. food and... <laughs> Like Peruvian food and like and, and they were really generous with it they were like if you're here eat up and then I would crash AFAM studies like 
events where they would go to fancy restaurants and then all of us grad students would like show up like these yeah. like hungry pathetic urchins and they would be like just join us whatever so we get a free meal at a restaurant I mean it was awesome and I just thought like that that was the whole like vibe of the department it was like there's always enough come join us you're a part of us whereas English was always like there's never enough and get out of here <laughs> I don't know, and I, yeah, and I'm still like that. If you offer me free food, I'll be there and I'll love you, right? Yeah. There was a question over here, so yeah. Hi, yes, thank you so much for uh, today's meeting. I wanted to know if you um, looked up to any writers when you were growing up, like what kind of books you liked, and if you saw a possibility of being a writer when you were growing up. So what, what were you... Who are, you, who are your people growing up? And also, um, if I could add on to that, just, you know, what was on your bookshelf when you were working on this? Like, what were some of the um, models for you as you endeavor, uh, as you sort of dove into your memoir? Right. No, that's a great question. And so to start to answer your question and then to move on to Hua's question, you know, growing up, I read, um, you know, I, I'm thinking about all the books that I really loved growing up. Um, I mean, in middle school and high school, I mean, I loved Jane Austen. I loved the Victorian writers. Like, I loved Charlotte Bronte. Um, I remember, and I write this in the book, you know, one of my favorite writers growing up, not so much now, but growing up, was um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, because I had read The Great Gatsby in high school, and I just thought, oh, wow, this, you know, depiction of the American dream, but also the, the dark side of that. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, I was excited to go to Princeton where I ended up going to college is because F, it was because F. Scott Fitzgerald attended that university. Um, and really a moment of heartbreak for me in college was in some ways I had told myself, oh, I could be just like him. I can be just like him. I want to have a career like him. I'm going to the same school as him I can approximate his trajectory. And then there was a moment, you know, I, I tried to join a club that he joined in a social club at Princeton that he had been a member of. And it was a very white, very upper middle, you know, it was upper class elitist kind of Southern. It was known as the most Southern of the clubs. And really, I think deep down, part of me wanted to join the club because I wanted to imagine myself sort of as somebody in his company. He had written his first novel in the library of this club. And I just thought, this is it. I'm getting as close to greatness as I can. Um, and I got rejected from that club. And it was this awful moment I think where I just, I mean, I knew I was being rejected socially from this particular club, but it also felt like if that club was also a literary club, you know, of letters, of American letters, that I also didn't belong in that club either because all the people who I aspired to be were part of that world, you know, were sort of part of that kind of elite literary world. And so, uh, you know, as I got older, as I went to graduate school and my exposure to different forms of literature expanded. I think what was so important about that is suddenly I was seeing these writers who I adored, but whose lives and whose trajectories were more similar to my own. Which, in some ways, you want to say, oh, but you could still have been like F. Scott Fitzgerald. But I think if you are raised in this country and you come from a certain racial or ethnic or class or gender background, those systems are there kind of preventing you from reaching those spaces. And so for me, the books that were on my shelf when I was reading, when I was writing this book, um, were things like, you know, the works of Claudia Rankin, the works of Ralph Ellison, the works of James Baldwin, the works of Toni Morrison, um, the works of uh, Kathy Park Hong. Um, I, I could just go on and on. And it was more, many of them more contemporary writers, but also writers who came from a background that was more similar to mine and whose experiences I could more readily identify with. And they gave me permission to write my book. I would not have written this book if I had not read their books. Yeah. Um, so I, first, as a clarifying question, because I know you mentioned um, that you do African and Amer Asian American literature, and I don't know if that's one course together or two courses, but um, I guess, how do you balance um, not being pigeonholed as an Asian American into just Asian American literature, but also being cautious of the space that you take up 
um, in whether you know, a job that could go to um, a black professor or in, uh, in the African-American literature space, how do you balance um, solidarity but also not taking up too much space or taking pay or job or, you know, from someone else? So uh, more about sort of your professional track, sort of like what you teach, but also sort of how you navigate um, kind of showing solidarity, but also creating space and taking space and making space? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that I still struggle with. Um, so I teach African-American literature, but when I graduated from uh, my PhD program, I actually initially tried to get jobs as a Victorianist, so a 19th century British literature scholar. Um, my dissertation had been on the intersection of 19th century British and African-American literature, but I absolutely did not feel like I was you know, qualified necessarily, or even entitled to apply for African American lit jobs. So I didn't, I tried to apply for these 19th century British jobs and I could not get a job, which anybody who's in academia, it's like, of course you couldn't get a job. There are no jobs, right? Um, but, you know, it was just year after year of feeling like I'm trying to do everything. I'm trying to follow what my mother said and be like twice as good and work twice as hard. And, you know, and, and I still couldn't, get employment. Um, so I was actually going to leave academia. I was looking at other jobs and um, what ended up happening, and this is a really interesting anecdote, is that um, my advisor, Henry Louis Gates Jr., who's an African-Americanist, um, there was a job, it was an affirmative action hire. It was a position, a target of opportunity, which is basically a euphemism for, you know, a, a job meant for, you know, somebody who's from a marginalized group. And the search committee at UNLV reached out to him and said, hey, do you know anybody who can teach African-American literature who's from a marginalized group? And Professor Gates wrote back and was like, I have a student, Julia Lee, who is Korean-American, <laughs> but she studied under me and I can vouch for her work and she can totally teach your African-American lit classes. And I remember, you know, then they asked me for my materials and I saw, I mean, I've been around, I, I mean, at that point I had been on the market for five years. I was like, this is not going to go anywhere. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, you know, I was like, thanks, Professor Gates, but uh, this is not going to happen. Um, and so, but then I ended up getting the job. And then I had that horrible moment where I was like, oh my God, I got the job because the department is so racist that they will not hire a black person for this job. They'll hire me though, because I'm the model minority. So I fit the marginalized identity just barely because sometimes I don't fit that identity when it comes to affirmative action hires or target of opportunity hires. Um, and so I was freaking out about that. Like I'm taking this job from somebody else who deserved it because the department's racist, whatever. Um, and it was, it, I mean, I had major anxiety about it and it's something that I had to work through because I was so grateful for the job, but I also really wanted to do justice and uh, yeah, make space for students, black students who might see me coming into the room and be like, and, and I have students who were like, yeah, you walked in the room and we were like, am I in the right class? What's going on, you know? And, and so, so much of it was about trying to acknowledge that I don't have their experience. I don't have their lived experience, but I have read a lot and I can talk a lot about this stuff. And I can also speak from the point of view of somebody who is a, a person of color um, and that that ends up, I think it ended up um, for a lot of my students, that was kind of a chance for them to be like, okay, I'll listen, I will consider it. And then the irony is that literally three years later, Asian Americans were taken out of the target of opportunity, they fell off. And so I wouldn't have been able to get this job three years later. And, you know, and then I had white colleagues who told me that I didn't actually count as diverse or I didn't count as a target of opportunity. Um, and meanwhile, you know, I, I subsequently left and got another job um, in Los Angeles. And now the department has zero Asian American professors, zero professors of Asian American descent, even though they claim that across the university, they have met the quota of 15% Asian American professors across the campus. So. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the scarcity idea that you brought up with the design and literature thing, but also as you're bringing up affirmative action, since I've been thinking a lot about the upcoming Supreme Court mm -hmm. case on affirmative action, what do you think are some possible solutions to 
I mean, I don't want to call it a scarcity myth, but it's not really a myth. Um, it's a dilemma, right? So how do you come across what you think are potential solutions or better ways to approach scarcity so that we don't look at allies as enemies? Mm -hmm. So the question is sort of how to, what are some expansive ways to think about beyond scarcity as uh, sort of the only way of thinking about how resources can be allocated? Yeah, um, I thought about this a lot too. So, you know, in the book I talk about how I really think scarcity, that scarcity mindset is foundational to white supremacy. So this idea there's not enough and so you have to fight for every little piece of the pie that you can and what this ends up doing is forcing those of us in minoritized positions to fight each other for the same small wedge of the pie, rather than thinking, hey, wait a second, why don't we want more of the whole pie? Like, why are we fighting each other when we really, we should be fighting this system of white supremacy that is preventing us from having access to the whole pie? And I think the affirmative action situation is exactly an example of this, where you know, for those of you who may not be aware of this, but you know, the, the affirmative action, the whole premise of it is, um, being challenged in the courts because, and they're using Asian Americans as the front, and it really is a front, it's a con, um, using Asian Americans as the plaintiffs to claim that Asian Americans are being discriminated against due to affirmative action policies, and that therefore it is racist against other people of color, and therefore it should get be gotten rid of, whatever, and it's pitting Asian Americans against brown and black applicants of these same, you know, colleges or whatever, um, when really, once again, instead of pitting them against one another for the same small wedge of pie, why don't we think about white supremacy as controlling, I mean, honestly, the people who are benefiting most from affirmative action are white people. It's white people who benefit from legacy admissions or from um, athletic recruitment. And I don't wanna get into trouble with people I know, but you know, I know somebody who is, who, you know, is a, you know, who benefits from both. And it's it just replicates privilege, right? So, but again, this shows you the way in which Asian Americans have been used both as a scapegoat, like sometimes when it's convenient, like with COVID, with the COVID epidemic or with, um, you know, World War II or whatever, it's like, you know, Asian Americans, like with the LA uprising, it's like, oh, it's Koreans, they're the racist ones, et cetera. Let's throw them out there if they're so convenient. So they're trotted out as skateboats when necessary, and then they're trotted out as poster childs when it's convenient for white supremacy. Like, look, the poor Asians. And it's like, no, no, do not be used as a pawn for white supremacy. Do not be used as a way to cover the fact that this is about white supremacists who want to preserve their privileged position in terms of getting all of these um, they're the ones who are benefiting from affirmative action. So my solution, honestly, is we should get rid of legacy admissions. We should get rid of legacy admissions. We should get rid of athletic recruitment, which people are always saying that'll never happen, right? Like athletic admissions, because, you know, if you don't have like an awesome sports team, how are you going to raise money, whatever, whatever. And then legacy admissions, same thing. It's like, well, all those donors are going to dissipate. And I don't care because guess what? My kids are legacies, right? <laughs> and I don't care. They don't need to go to my school. They shouldn't go to my school. They sh they, I, 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 but I keep tell I keep hearing that this could never happen. But maybe it will. <laughs> um, you've given us all something to work towards. So thank you, um, thank you to Amali, the wonderful staff at Books of Magic, uh, our, our friends at C-SPAN, uh, everyone on YouTube right now, and uh, thanks everyone for coming out tonight as well. Uh, Julia will be signing books in the back. I believe. Yes. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much. Oh my for gosh. Thank you, Hua. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs>basically just did my whole outro for me so we're gonna keep having you do events with us um yes exactly that if you're still with us on the youtube live stream you can buy a copy of binding the hand by clicking the link in the description for everyone else we have plenty of additional copies available tonight so if you haven't gotten one yet i highly recommend you do we also have signed copies of Qua's memoir stay true which is also a which fantastic is awesome. read yeah absolutely so get both while you're here um my coworker Jules is gonna quickly point to where Julia will be signing. 
It's a little bit hidden by the camera, but we ask that you all line up down the center aisle and kind of curve around. Please make sure that you grab all of your personal belongings with you so that our staff can start to rearrange the space. That's all. Let's give these two one last round of applause. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight.